sister live with me. I mean, of course, it has its disadvantage. Curfew. Yeah, but it's, it's energizing having someone live with you who has big dreams. Rock star. What happened to Senator? That was last week. Dreams. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Can I get my nose pierced? Dream on, kid. For today's grim adventure, we have a bit of a hard tale to tell. We're going back to July 18th, 1989 to this building right behind me, which is 120 Sweetser Avenue here in West Hollywood. Now, if you're just like me and you love history, more importantly, Hollywood movie history, then you already know that this building right here is where 21-year-old Rebecca Schaefer was murdered back in 1989. It's a very sad story. What makes the death of Rebecca Schaefer even sadder, even worse, is she was just getting started in her acting career. She started off as a model who made the cover of Seventeen magazine, which led into her getting a part on the TV show My Sister Sam, a couple other different acting roles, including a movie called Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. Now let's think about this for a second. Rebecca Schaefer was only 21 years old and she basically had her own TV show. And like I said, this was the beginning of her acting career that was cut short. So you can only imagine what she could have done. Now it was on the set of My Sister Sam where Robert John Bardo at the age of 19 at the time became obsessed with her. Bardo started sending fan mail to the studio for Rebecca Schaefer on the set of My Sister Sam. Now, she loved her fans and she tried to respond to as much fan mail as possible and she actually responded to one of his letters. One of his letters. She, he sent a lot. And she sent him a letter or a postcard as well as a signed autographed photo that said love on it. And that just pretty much helped fuel his obsession. Now it's important to note that while all this was going on, Bardo was actually living in Tucson, Arizona, but he came out here to Hollywood on two different occasions to try to visit her and bring her gifts in person. Both times was down at the studio where they were making the TV show. The first time he tried to visit her, he brought a teddy bear as well as some flowers, but the security guard turned him away and he went back to Tucson, Arizona. A couple months later, he came back, this time with a knife to the same studio, but a different security guard, again, turned him away and he went back to Tucson. Two failed attempts. On uh, June the 2nd, 1987, uh, my, the, our guard uh, at the ranch gate called me and said, no, oh, pardon me, he called my secretary first and said, there's a fellow here that's been here lots of times who has a large bouquet and about a five foot teddy bear and he's left it with us and he wants us to deliver it to Rebecca Schaefer. Uh, what should we do? Knowing that this individual had called numerous times and been referred to us by the production company of my sister Sam because he called them so many times, I said, pack up the teddy bear, the flowers, and Bardo and him and bring him to my office. I want to talk to him. After two failed attempts of trying to get in contact with Rebecca Schaefer, for some reason his obsession with her kind of took a back seat for the time being. Instead, he turned his obsessions to people like Debbie Gibson and a couple other different musicians. Now, it wasn't until Rebecca Schaefer appeared in a movie called Scenes from a Class Struggle in Beverly Hills, where she, on screen, she's in bed with a man, that Bardo just kind of loses it. And then he comes back to Hollywood. She gets a big part in a movie called Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. My idea of taking a risk is 
losing my birth control pills or, or shopping at sex without a sale. Which has a love scene in it. Willie, you need to get a girlfriend before you turn into a pervert. Which is a break from her character that she had played on My Sister Sam. And this flicked some sort of evil switch inside Robert John Bardo. That's what happens in the mind of stalkers. They sit on their sofa, they watch television, and the person's character speaks to them. And then at some point they get off their sofa and they go to the door. This time, instead of going to the studio, Bardo's plan is to visit Rebecca Schaefer at her house. Problem is, had no idea where she lives. So he hires a private detective in Tucson to find the address. And back then, it was really easy. All you had to do was go to the DMV, pay a small fee, fill out some forms, and they'll tell you whatever you want. Again, all of that has changed, mainly because of what happened to Rebecca Schaefer here. Zinkus testifies that Bardo hired him to find Rebecca Schaefer's birth date and home address in May of 1989, two months before the murder. Clark then asks about the defendant's mental condition at the time. During the course of your conversations with Mr. Bardo over the 10 contacts you indicated you had, was there ever any indication to you that he was violent or posed any menace or threat to yourself or the party he was trying to locate? None. At all times, was your conversation or the tenor of your conversation polite? Yes, it was. Did you ever become concerned about his mental stability? No. And there was nothing I take it in his behavior that caused you to have any concern about uh, giving him the information he was requesting? No, there wasn't. I have nothing further. Now, he does that, and he comes to Hollywood, and he's on this street. He has the address, but he's not sure if this is where she lives. So he actually walks up and down the street that I'm walking on right now, talking to different people who are walking, asking them, hey, does Rebecca Schaefer actually live here? Showing them this picture, this signed photo that she sent him, showing that to them and saying, hey, does she really live here? Did you have any kind of unusual experience when you were at Jay's Market on the morning of July 18th, 1989? Uh, yes, a man came up to me and uh, stopped me and uh, showed me a picture and asked me if I knew this girl, if I'd seen this girl in the neighborhood. And do you see that man in court today? Yes, I do. Could you please point him out? Right over there. Where were his eyes? His eyes, well, I don't even know exactly where his eyes were, but it's a, he wasn't looking down. He was, you know, kind of moving like this, I'd say. And then you add your walking movement. And I believe that your testimony was that he did not appear to be aware of his surroundings. Do you recall that? Yeah, I recall that. He, he, he obviously didn't notice me. After you made the delivery, what happened next? Uh, well, I, I proceeded back towards my car and uh, the defendant uh, was calling out to me from across the street and uh, I you know try to ignore him and, and just make go back to my car and uh, I got inside my car and he was still calling to me and trying to get my attention he asked me if I had seen her around the neighborhood or if I knew that she lived around there or not did you respond to him uh, yes I said no I've never seen her before he asked me if I had just delivered to the uh, apartment building. Rebecca Schaefer's building? Yes. Did you answer him? Uh, I, I believe I said something like uh, that I, I didn't want to answer any more questions. And after getting the confirmation that he was looking for, he does the unthinkable. He rings a doorbell. And that brings us right here once again to the front door of 120 Sweetser Avenue. Now Bardo walks right up here. And the call box and the mailboxes are no longer here. In photos, they would have been right there to the right of your screen. So he rings the doorbell, apartment number four. That's where she was living and actually said Schaefer on the little bell as well as the mailbox. And the intercom doesn't work, so Rebecca Schaefer comes down the stairs. Let's see. 
those stairs right there in her bathrobe. Comes down. I'm gonna back up a little bit. She comes down, she opens the door, and Bardo's standing here. And he talks to her. Bardo tells of the chilling moment when he approaches Rebecca Schaefer's doorway. And then I look, I see him and down the hallway. Uh, I was like, so I had to stare at her. I was like, you know, I was like, there she is, you know, I don't have to shoot any security guards to get her. And she's right there in front of me, you know, and I, and I didn't even shoot her, you know, I was, the girl was in the back, you know, I was still talking to her, you know, like she was just a regular person, you know. There was no big security guards, you know, she wasn't dressed up glamorously like some And I, you know, I was just, you know, I was just, just right there, it's just me and her, you know. That's like what most guys, who fantasize about seeing their favorite celebrity, you know? And this was it, it's just me and her, you know? I'm talking to her, you know? And I wasn't focusing too much attention on her, but it seemed like she said, uh, you mean to come to my door, just give me a letter, you know, come again, you know? Like she was, like I was bothering her, and I thought, that was such an arrogant statement, you know? That fact, she, she was mumbling, she sounded like a little kid, you know? She sounded like a little, she has a kid, like a kid voice, like, like she sounded like a little brat or something. And, and Wasting, wasting, you know, wasting your time, you know, like, like I'm, you know, I mean, I thought that was very calisthenic to say to a fan. She ends up saying goodbye and says, you know, don't come back, you know, this is my private property, thank you for stopping by, you're a fan, but please just, just leave me alone. So she shuts the door and goes back upstairs. Not too happy with how things turned out, Bardo heads down to a restaurant here in Hollywood a couple blocks away known as Jan's restaurant. Today it's no longer that, it's a Chipotle. He sits down, he has onion rings and a cheesecake and he contemplates what happened. And he's kind of tiffed about it, but then he realizes that he has things that he forgot to give Rebecca Schaefer. So he comes back to the apartment. This time when she opens the door she sees him and she says something along the lines of, you again, I, th I thought I told you not to come here. And he says, I forgot to give you something. And he reaches inside his jacket and he pulls a 357 out of a paper bag and shoots her point blank in the chest. And she falls right here on these bricks. I grabbed the door. Gun still in there. I reached around, grabbed, grabbed on the chair. This. Blood hit her here, blood squirted out, and she went, she was just screaming. I heard then, screaming my mind, ah, and I'm screaming, oh my god. And I was like, oh my god, oh fuck, you know, I, 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 I did, I killed her, you know. And she was like screaming, and she was, she, she felt that, she fought me, her arms were screaming, she's this, you know, she's constantly doing it. She hit the ground, she, she was going, well, and I was looking at her, oh my god, I killed someone, oh no, I, no, I did, oh no, you know, because, you know, no, I can't, no, no, I couldn't pull back the action, I just did, you know, and she was, uh, she was going, uh, why, why, she's screaming, and she's just straight screaming, I was screaming, why, why? Now you can see the apartment building and the reflection of the glass. Now eyewitnesses say they heard a gunshot and screams. And he looks out the window and they witness a guy in a long sleeve, button down yellow shirt run down the street into an alleyway. Runs over here and finds Rebecca Schaefer, 21 years old, laying here. Checks for a pulse, there's none. She's pronounced dead 30 minutes later at the hospital down the street. There was actually a couple different witnesses that day who heard the gunshot as well as seeing somebody run down the sidewalk. Now, a couple different accounts, they say that he ran down the sidewalk, then into an alleyway, and other people say that he ran right down this little corridor that leads to the alleyway behind the house. So we're gonna take a walk down there. Looks like I got a visitor. Not a big fan of birds, but thank you for saying hello, my friend. A 
filming this right now. It's 8.30 in the morning, so as I walk back here, I'm gonna be quiet, because I don't know if people are asleep or if they're home. Now let's say that Bardo did run down this little walkway next to the building to the alleyway in the back. Again, he was wearing a long sleeve button down yellow shirt, which was found on a rooftop a couple blocks away. He threw it up there and he was also carrying a red book. Now this is the crazy part. I mean, even more crazy as to what happened. The book was Catcher in the Rye, the same book that Chapman was carrying and reading whenever he killed John Lennon. That too was found on the roof of a building a couple blocks away. Bardo threw that up there as well. So that's behind there. The alleyway's back here. So all intents and purposes, the, the buildings, the rooftops that he threw the items up are down that way. So Bardo would have run that way. Uh, I looked for the addresses. I didn't look too hard of where the buildings were, where he threw the items up on the roof, but they're down there. So we know that he ran that way. But if we turn and we look down this alleyway, if we were to keep going straight, I mean, just keep going straight, blocks down there, that's the heart of Hollywood. Now, after shooting Rebecca Schaefer, Bardo didn't stick around Hollywood. He actually hopped on a bus and went back to Tucson, Arizona, where he was captured the very next day. Now, how he was caught is interesting in itself. So, basically, back in Tucson, he walked out into traffic and was walking into traffic, like into the direction, trying to get hit by a car, trying to commit suicide. The police eventually got him in custody and immediately he confessed to shooting Rebecca Schaefer. Now we can't go visit Rebecca Schaefer's final resting place, at least not in this video or this, this story here in LA. She's actually buried in Seattle. But Bardo, he eventually went to trial waived his right to a jury. He was found guilty and he's currently serving a life sentence for the murder of Rebecca. It's really sad that somebody like Rebecca Schaefer had to die in order for laws to change. But like I said, her death was kind of like the, the tipping point factor as to why we have stalker laws now. I mean, we hear about it in the news all the time people breaking into places, showing up in people's bedrooms, swimming in celebrity swimming pools. It can get crazy.